In the world of mixed martial arts, there have been several remarkable stories that have captivated the hearts and fans around the globe. Some stories stand out above the rest, but none are as intriguing as the tale of Lee Murray, a man who has captured the hearts and minds of millions of fans with his incredible skill and determination and whose life took unexpected turns both inside and outside of the octagon. With a record of 18 wins and 8 losses, Lee Murray may not seem like a fighter who would leave a lasting impression. However, it is his story and the events surrounding his life that have made him a legend in the MMA world. This is the extraordinary journey of Lee Lightning Murray. Lee Brahim Murray Lamrani was born on the 12th of November 1977 in London. Lee Murray grew up in the rough neighbourhood where street fighting was common. These early years shaped him into a tough and fearless individual that would serve him well in his future career as a professional fighter. On his mother, Barbara Murray's side, Lee's family hails from Bermondsley, a densely populated semi docklands part of South London between Tower Bridge and Old Kent Road, which is considered a traditional breeding ground for professional criminals, especially armed robbers. Barbara was a hairdresser and later a telephonist. On a holiday to Grand Canaria, she met Lee's father, Brahim Lamrani. The couple's first child, Lee, was born in St. Nicholas Hospital, Plumstead, on the 12th of November 1977, and was initially raised by his mother, while Brahim continued to live and work in the Canary Islands. Eventually, he moved to England and married Barbara in 1984, and in 1985, she gave birth to Lee's only sibling, Kia. The family lived at 11 Buttmarsh Close, Plumstead, and Murray attended Foxfield Primary School, where he met his future wife, Siobhan Rawlins, three years his junior. Murray had a difficult relationship with his father, who was often drunk and described as a frightening, violent man. Largely absent from the first seven years of his life, Brahim demanded his respect and obedience to the point of a police warning for mistreatment. Eventually, Lee began to fight back against his father. The next door neighbor heard that Brahim actually went and hit Lee, and Lee snapped, just turned around and knocked his dad clean out. Once he realized he could take down a big man like that, I think that's what changed Lee into the man he is now. Their relationship grew tempestuous, that Brahim felt living together would result in a death, so he moved out. Barbara was then left to raise Lee and Kia largely on her own. At this time, Lee began attending Eaglesfield Boys School, which is where he met his eventual best friend and partner in crime, Paul Allen. He was expelled and got enrolled at Woolwich School to complete the statutory years of school. By then, Lee was living on the streets and was a member of a gang based on the Barnfield estate with stealing and dealing drugs as part of everyday life. He was in daily contact with Nigerian drug dealers who operated at Plumstead train station and an eventual turf war broke out that saw Murray and his friends win a local territory in drug trading. Lee was eventually convicted of possession of cocaine and cannabis and was named in the Old Bailey as a notorious London drug dealer who employed Paul Allen as his right hand man, plus a network of drug runners. One of his best friends from his empire at the time was a local ruffian and future mixed martial arts named Mark the Beast Epstein, who claimed that he and Lee sold crack cocaine and Lee made a lot of money from it. Lee was sentenced to a term at Feltham Young Offenders Institution, the first of his custodial sentences for what ranked as his more minor offenses, such as assault and thievery. Others followed in Dover and Norwich. Rowlands, Murray's girlfriend, gave birth to their first child, Lily Jane, on the 24th of December 1998. Weeks later, Lee was caught up in a turf war with rival drug dealers that led to the arrest of his friend, Epstein, and more than a dozen others, many ending up in prison. Lee, however, got clean away with Epstein covering his mistake. Lee married his girlfriend on the 24th of November 2000, listing himself on their wedding certificate as a professional fighter. Lee would later divorce her in 2008 while incarcerated in Morocco. Shortly after dodging arrest, Lee was introduced to mixed martial arts and he competed his first fight on the 5th of December 1999 at an event called Millennium Brawl that was held at Hemel Hempstead Pavilion. His opponent was Rob Hudson and Murray knocked him out in the first round, prompting event promoter Andy Jardine to say he was so quick they called him Lightning Lee Murray. 
Lee's successful debut led to him begin training seriously. He jogged around the Abbey Wood estate and attended two gyms. London Shoot Fighters in White City for wrestling and Peacock's Gym in Canning Town for boxing. Martin Bowers, who ran Peacock's with his brothers Tony and Paul, described Murray as a very nice boy who conducted himself well. At the time that Lee was training at Peacock's Gym, the Bowers brothers were planning a series of robberies, the biggest being a brazen raid on a high security warehouse at Gatwick Airport. Their scheme involved disguising themselves as security officers using a fake Brinks Mad van to get into the depot and then stealing £1 million in foreign currency. After Scotland Yard found out about the planned heist, all three brothers were arrested and jailed. It has been speculated that while Lee had no prior knowledge about the caper, the schematics that were later revealed publicly may have given him some of the ideas that were used in the similar Securitas depot robbery. Lee had four professional fights in 2000. The first was a 12th of March encounter with Mike Tomlinson under the banner of Ring of Truth. Lee won the fight to Murat's submission in first round. His second fight was Tomlinson. Murray caught him with a few good rights and won the fight. Lee Murray's next bout took place on the 17th of June 2000 in a tournament fought at Extreme Challenge 34. Lee defeated his first opponent, Chris Albandia, by ankle lock in the first round. The victory advanced Lee to the second round of the tournament, but he lost by armbar to Canadian submission specialist Joe Dorkerson. In the opening round, Lee said that when he went into the final, I was so happy and excited about winning the first, I just sort of lost my focus. Lee's next fight was just later, a 9th of July contest against Danny Rushton, a fighter who had gained a reputation for toughness due to his competing in true no holds barred competitions in Russia. The match ended up a no contest, however, after Rushton collapsed in the first round due to exhaustion. At some point in 2000, Murray travelled to Bettendorf, Iowa to train at the renowned Mile Tech fighting systems camp run by former UFC welterweight champion Pat Mile Tick. In an interview conducted before the Rushton fight, Murray stated that whilst at MFS, he trained a hell of a lot of groundwork and a lot of kickboxing too. On the 11th of March 2001, Lee Murray fought to a draw against Chris Bacon at Millennium Brawl 2, Capital Punishment. He followed that up with a first round knockout of Gary Warren at Millennium Brawl 3, Independence Day on the 1st of July. In 2003, Murray made his debut in the UFC, one of the biggest MMA promotions in the world. Murray smashed an 8-2-1 record in similar promotions before receiving a contract with the Ultimate Fighting Championship. In his UFC debut, he, defe he defeated George Riviera by triangle choke armbar in the first round. His fight against George Riviera was a defining moment in his career. Murray dominated Riviera throughout the entire fight and secured a TKO victory in the first round. The win catapulted him into the spotlight and he was dubbed the best fighter you've never heard of by UFC commentator Joe Rogan. This was Murray's only fight in the UFC due to complications with his US visa as a result of ongoing criminal prosecution against him in the UK for assault after he attacked a man during a road rage incident. Murray was scheduled to fight Patrick Courtier on UFC 52 but was replaced by former opponent Joe Dorskin. This led to Murray signing with the Cage Rage promotion. On the 11th of September 2004, Lee fought future UFC middleweight champion Anderson Silva in Cage Rage 8 for the vacant middleweight title. Silva won by unanimous decision. Murray's time with Cage Rage was also short-lived due to injuries resulting from a stabbing which prevented Murray from continuing his MMA career. However, just as his career was taken off, Murray's life outside the cage began to unravel. In 2006, he was arrested for involvement in the biggest cash heist in British history known as the Securitas Depot robbery. The heist took place on February the 22nd, 2006 at the Securitas Depot in Tombridge, Kent, England. It was a meticulously planned and executed robbery that left the authorities baffled and the public in awe. The Securitas Depot in Tombridge was considered to be one of the most secure places in England. It was a fortified building with a several high-tech security measures in place. The vault inside the depot was where millions of pounds were stored, waiting to be transferred to banks and businesses across the country. The 2006 Security Depot robbery in Tombridge, England was the UK's largest cash heist. 
It began with a kidnapping on the evening of the 21st of February 2006 and ended in the early hours of the 22nd of February. Seven criminals stole almost 53 million pound. The gang left behind another 154 million because they did not have the means to transport it. The criminals stole 53 million pound in used and unused sterling notes, the property of the Bank of England. Most of the getaway vehicles were found in the following week, one containing 1.3 million pound in stolen notes. In raids by Kent Police, 9 million pound was discovered in Welling and 8 million in Southborough. The criminals had carefully studied the layout of the depot and have even managed to obtain a copy of the keys to the vault. On the day of the heist, they entered the depot dressed as police officers and tied up the employees before making their way to the vault. Lee Murray, the alleged mastermind, had fled to Morocco with his friend and accomplice Paul Allen. He was successfully fought extradition to the UK and was imprisoned there for the robbery. Allen was extradited and after a second trial in 2008 was jailed in the UK. Upon his release, he was shot and injured in 2019. By 2016, 32 million pound remained unrecovered and several suspects were still at large. Murray was stopped by Kent Police on the 28th of July 2005 while in his car on a road overlooking the depot, together with two unidentified men. As well as being a cage fighter, Murray was also a drug dealer. Hysenaj signed up with the recruitment agency which supplied workers to Medway House. He was first given a job at Royal Victoria Palace shopping centre in Royal Tunbridge Wells and then at the end of 2005 offered work at the depot. Several days before the robbery, Murray went clubbing in London and crashed his yellow Ferrari sports car on the new Kent Road the next morning. Murray fled the scene and was arrested by four police officers nearby. He was charged with assault in a case that never came to trial. When he had abandoned his car, he left behind two burner phones containing numbers of other gang members and three photographs from the club which showed him associating with Allen and Patterson. The police later recovered these items from the impounded car. Murray had accidentally recorded himself on one of the phones talking to Russia about how to carry out the robbery. In the early evening of Tuesday the 21st of February 2006, Colin Dixon, the depot's manager, was driving home along the A249, a road in Kent, when he was pulled over just outside Stockbury, a village northeast of Maidstone, by what he presumed was an unmarked police car. The Volvo S60 had flashing blue lights in its grille, and one of the two uniformed officers came to Dixon's window, asking him to turn off his engine and leave the keys in the ignition. Breaching protocol, Dixon followed the officer's order to step out of his car and to sit on the other car, where he was handcuffed. The two men impersonating police officers next drove to Dixon's home in Herm Bay and spoke to Lynn Dixon, telling her that her husband had crashed his car, that she and her son should accompany them to the hospital as quickly as possible. When she got into the car, Lynn Dixon realised it was not a real police car and the men told her she was being abducted. The entire robbery was filmed on the building CCTV and when Kent police later reviewed the footage, they nicknamed this gang member Policeman. Policeman subdued the operator and without being asked, Dixon pressed the button which opened the gate and allowed the vehicles to enter the yard. The rest of the gang now entered the building. The criminals faces were hidden by balaclavas and they were armed with handguns, shotguns, AK-47 assault rifles and a Scorpion submachine gun. Dixon urged a staff to comply with the gang's commands and 14 workers were tied up. Nobody pressed on along. The seven members of the gang attempted to load metal cages full of banknotes into the lorry and found they were too heavy. So one criminal tried to drive the Lansing Lind power lifter and the rest shoved the hostages out the way. The criminals stole just shy of 53 million pound in used and unused banknotes. Another 154 million pound would not fit in the lorry and they had to leave it behind. In total, they took 17 cages and three trolleys full of banknotes. The staff workers were left locked inside empty cages, as were Lynn Dixon and her son. No alarm had been set off and the gang ordered the staff to stay still when they left at 2.44 a.m. At 3.15 a.m., when they were sure the robbers had gone, the staff triggered an alarm which called the police. The police arrived and began the investigation by interviewing the staff and taking their clothes on their DNA profiles. 
Once inside the vault, Murray and his accomplices loaded £53 million into a waiting truck and a getaway car, and a getaway truck. They left behind a few employees who were bound and gagged along with some fake explosive devices to create confusions by their more time. The entire heist took less than an hour, but it would take years for the authorities to catch up to Lee Murray. As news of the heist spread, it became clear that this was not just the work of one person. The level of planning execution involved suggested a well-connected criminal mastermind. The police launched an extensive investigation, but it wasn't until a mysterious phone call that they got their first lead. A man claiming to be one of the robbers called the police and told them where they could find the abandoned truck used in the heist. This led to the arrest of several suspects, including former mixed martial arts, fighter Lee Murray. On the 25th of June 2006, in a joint operation with Moroccan police, Murray was arrested at a shopping centre in Susi district of the capital Rabat for suspected involvement in the Securitas Depot robbery. Moroccan police said they had to use specialist techniques to arrest the suspects because they were specialists in mixed martial arts and fire firearms. Kent police said in a statement that they had been tracking Murray for three months and would be seeking his extradition from Morocco. There is no treaty between the UK and Morocco and the process was expected to take months. Later, Moroccan police revealed that Murray had also been charged with possession of hard drugs. On the 27th of June 2006, Kent police confirmed the news of Murray's arrest in Morocco and also stated that over 30 people had now been arrested in conjunction with the investigation. In June 2009, Murray attempted to escape Seal Prison. Small sores were found in a place of biscuits in Murray's cell by another prisoner who broke into it. Prison officials believe Murray was planning to cut through the iron bars of his cell with a saw. To make the escape through the small window easier, Murray had lost a significant amount of weight. Murray was in a different cell at the time as punishment for being caught with a laptop computer. Other prisoners in seal held it against Murray that he was able to use his money to smuggle in items like these, as well as expensive clothes. The fellow prisoner who broke into a cell was doing so to steal some of Murray's belongings. Murray and his accomplices were put on trial in 2008. He was convicted of the £53 million crime in a Moroccan court in June 2010. Kent police said Murray must serve 10 years in jail in Morocco for his involvement. This sentence was then extended to 25 years on the 30th of November 2010 after he was caught attempting to escape for the second time. He now resides in a Moroccan prison and is expected to spend a majority of his life there. The aftermath of the £53 million heist was chaotic. Many of Murray's accomplices were arrested and convicted, but a significant amount of money still remained unaccounted for. Rumours circulated that some of the stolen money had been spent on extravagant parties and expensive cars. After the heist, Murray had, held, had fled to Morocco, where he lived as a fugitive for several years. Due to the largest cash heist in history, a new documentary, Catching Lightning, has been documented to tell Murray's story and has received a notable response worldwide. As the director of the movie, Murray had already been through a lot. The Moroccan government had doubled his sentence, so they initially gave him 10-year prison term. There's no parole in Morocco. The £53 million heist by Lee Murray remains one of the most notorious crimes in British history. Murray's story has been the subject of many books, documentaries and even a feature film. In addition to the robbery, the film will also concentrate on Murray's life, including his mixed martial arts career. In March 2023, Showtime announced the airing of their four-episode docuseries Catch and Lightning as part of its original programming for April 2023. Thank you for watching the video, everyone. I hope you have enjoyed today's content. If yes, then please don't forget to provide some feedback in the comment section below and please subscribe to the channel if you're enjoying the content. Thank you for now.